Folks, I'm really excited here to, to kind of share with you um, our thought process and where we're kind of headed. Hopefully you found um, the previous two sessions uh, in interesting, but you know, uh, we think we have some of the best uh, storage technology out there for Kubernetes and cloud native workflows. And, and you know, we really value a lot from what our customers uh, tell us and the kind of feedback they give us. And so we're a super paranoid bunch, right? And we're always worried about how to stay ahead of the curve. And uh, we've been doing a lot of thinking, and, and this is kind of my thought process here. Uh, in order for Pure and Portworx to be um, you know, um, uh, more and more relevant and more of a thought leader in this space over the next four or five years, I kind of put, it, put our vision down in, in, in saying that we need to move along three vectors. Clearly, we need to be the best uh, core infrastructure for Kubernetes, and we'll continue to do that, right? So we'll continue to add more technologies to what I showed you. But we need to move along to other access, too. We need to add more cloud and services type of capabilities in our product, and we need to move more up the stack, embrace more of the applications that people are trying to deploy. At the end of the day, our customers, right, they don't want to focus on infrastructure and, uh, at all. And um, for them, when they want to consume, um, you know, storage kind of resources, they're thinking of more about storage as a service or data as a service. And so they don't even want to manage their uh, SQL database. They just want it available as a service. And so I'm excited to talk about something called Pure Managed Data Services, which is basically a curated set of data services um, that comes with a single pane of glass. Um, you, the end users can click and select and say, I want a SQL service, or I want a NoSQL service, or I want a message queue. And Porrox goes and provisions the application, including the storage infrastructure and networking infrastructure needed to make that happen in a very Kubernetes specific way, and ultimately gives the end user a very simple endpoint that they could use to interact with that service. We support out of the box, a whole bunch of different databases here, Couchbase, um, uh, Redis, and so on. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to quickly turn it over to Umer. I want to introduce Umer, uh, who joins us recently. Uh, Umer uh, ran a, uh, a, a, D, a, a DBA team, right? So Umer was a customer of Portworx, um, one of our early customers. And um, um, I won't mention the name of the company, but um, with a very small team, uh, four or five people were able to support um, a very large number of developers for, 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 for his company. And, um, um, you know, ultimately his customers would come to him and say, uh, Umer and team, I want a SQL service. And they could just hit a simple button and it's up and running. They used Portworx under the hood. We were very intrigued by how they built that platform. We were able to get that technology, um, which uh, was called Project Stella, um, uh, which is now part of Pure called PDS. And with that, Umer, I will turn it over to you. Okay, um, so this is going to be a demo of Portworx data services. As Gu mentioned, we're really just trying to move up the stack and get away from sort of the software defined storage infrastructure level and really talk about things in terms that, that end users really want to see, which is really applications. How do I deploy a database in Portworx or in, on top of Portworx in Kubernetes and have it manage all of my underlying uh, storage needs? So, kill this. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit uh, what the end user experience is going to be, but I'm also, because this is a technical audience, I'm going to dive down behind the scenes and show you actually what's happening uh, at the at the Kubernetes layer. But really, the, the user experience is going to be really just uh, sort of a UI or an API if, if you know, for DevOps, SRE types of workloads, if people want to automate this and build Terraform plans, this is all API driven, so they'll be able to do that. So what you're seeing here um, is our PDS uh, dashboard. If I flip over here, you'll see that I actually have a couple of Kubernetes clusters running. Um, this, uh, this terminal right here, this tab is my target cluster. This is one of the Kubernetes target clusters where I'm going to uh, deploy a database. Uh, the second uh, tab here is a second Kubernetes cluster. And then uh, this first tab here is actually my PDS control plane. So this is where actual PDS runs. This is a SaaS product. Um, we're going to have this running in our own uh, multi-tenant environment, and I'll show you what's going to be happening a little bit under the under the hood there. Uh, one thing to note in my two different Kubernetes clusters, you'll see these are different namespaces that exist in Kubernetes. And just to, I want to point out in target cluster one, I have created a dev namespace and a QA namespace. So let's go ahead and just look at this for a second. And then in target cluster two, there's a dev namespace and there's a prod namespace. So 
that'll come into play in a second when I'm actually going to deploy these things. Okay, so back into my into my dashboard. Um, I'm just going to focus on a database deployment today. There's a whole uh, there's a whole part of PDS that deals with automating backups, running them on a schedule, taking as Gu mentioned, sort of application aware snapshots, logical dumps of data, storing them up into an object store for DR purposes. But for today's uh, session, we're just going to we're just going to go through and, and deploy a database. So again, the idea is to keep this simple, build in all of the, um, the magic under the hood that is Portworx, but for the end user, keep it very, very simple. For my UI, I get to select any number of supported database types. Um, today, we're just gonna run through a Cassandra um, deployment. These are all uh, curated images um, by Portworx. So um, you can rest assured that whatever you select is is one that's been tested on a variety of Kubernetes platforms and Portworx uh, storage. So we're going to pick the three eleven nine uh, image, and this is where, um, if you if you remember a second ago, I was showing you the different namespaces that lived in different environments. So if I pick the the dev environment, you can see that PDS automatically knows that uh, that that namespace exists in two different uh, Kubernetes clusters. Likewise, if I pick prod you would see that it automatically is aware of where that environment lives or that namespace lives. And likewise, if I pick QA, you'd see that it's, it knows that it was in target cluster one. So what I'm gonna do actually today is I'm actually gonna deploy into the dev environment and actually deploy uh, clusters into both, clus uh, Cassandra clusters into both Kubernetes clusters simultaneously. So we'll call this tech field day. I'm presented with uh, some pre-configured templates uh, so an, an administrator could have come in here and said, I only want people to be able to deploy small Cassandra clusters, meaning minimal CPU or minimal storage. Um, and uh, and these, these values get auto-populated. I can actually override these. So I could say, um, these, are, these specific configurations down here are going into my Cassandra uh, image itself. So these are runtime configurations. So I could, for example, override the rack name. I could say that this is, uh, you know, Rack two and the data center that it's running in is US West two, for example. And that's really it. We hit create database and off, off to the races we go. So we're, what's happening under the hood is there's a couple of pipelines in our control plane that are getting triggered. Um, and we, we're, we'll follow along. Actually, it looks like this one's done already. If I jump over here, again, this was the control plane um, cluster. You'll see that there were a couple of pipelines that ran and they've already completed and succeeded. So we should see now in our target clusters, we should see some database objects. Now, these are actually custom resources um, and there's actually a specific custom resource type for each application that we support. So in this case, this is a Cassandra application. You'll notice that um, the specific configurations that we, that we asked for are, are specified here. One other thing I wanna point out, again, this is using Portworx magic under the hood. If you remember earlier in, in, in Joe's session and even Goo's session, they were talking about storage classes that, that get created in, in Portworx. So PDS automates all of that. So uh, we know as a best practice, we've been deploying many types of databases. We know what sort of the IO profile is for a Cassandra database. We, want it, we know how we wanna set up replication at the block storage level. So we go ahead and automatically create a new um, storage class to handle that. So you can actually see, um, you'll see that there's this storage class that got created with parameters that get passed through to the underlying Portworx provisioner. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna kind of skip over how some of that magic happens. Um, I also wanna point out that one of the difficult things of running uh, databases in Kubernetes is actually having ingress. And I don't mean ingress in the HTTP sense of Kubernetes, but actually how do I direct my read request or my write request to the master node of, for example, a Postgres database or, or a, to a specific shard. So one of the things PDS does is it actually sets up a dedicated Kubernetes services to front each of our pods. So I can actually address each individual, um, each, indiv oops, each individual node in my cluster directly. So for example, we'll automatically create a DNS record and this will, this will suffice for, uh, for service discovery purposes. If I needed to send you know, a write request to node zero in my Cassandra cluster, 
not only can I direct the read request directly to that node, but I actually have uh, actually have a a connection string that that directs uh, request directly to that pod. Likewise, I can actually get back all of the IPs for um, for all of the pods in my cluster. So if I look back at the end of the day, what you're really left with are pods that are running your Cassandra application. So I should be able to jump into any one of these, for example, and run a Cassandra command and see that I have a a fully um, I have a full three node Cassandra cluster that was auto formed, right? It went and did the cluster initialization. All of the other nodes in the um, in the in the Cassandra cluster met each other. They knew how to how to communicate and that they were still part of the same cluster. And likewise, in my second target cluster, I'll have the same thing. So this is what's happening under the hood. And again, from the from user experience point of view, in the UI, a user creates the database and they just come to this. Um, they'll, they'll come to this screen and they'll see right off the bat what the connection string is and the ports that they connect to, and that's all they need to get up uh, get get up and running with uh, a functional Cassandra cluster. Yeah. So, so, but just one question for me then. So, um, and, and I'm going to say this and and hope it doesn't sound really rude. Um, is that how much of how with this, obviously this is embargo till the end of September. So how much is, is there additional stuff going on under uh, behind the scenes in port, port works, or is this just giving me kind of a nice interface and a bit of an application catalog um, to uh, just built on top of port works? Or are you doing other stuff underneath the covers? There's a lot going on under the covers and, it, and it's unfortunate that I don't have time to, to go into too much detail, but there are a lot of custom extensions that we've added in on top of Kubernetes. So if you remember, think of Portworks as being that 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 storage layer. It's really infrastructure. The difficult thing about running, say, Cassandra in this case on Kubernetes isn't the storage part. I mean, that's that is a challenge. But the difficulty of running Cassandra in Kubernetes is the fact that it's a distributed application, and you have multiple Cassandra nodes that need to be able to talk to each other. Um, and you and if one of the one of the nodes fails, then does another pod start up, and does it get attached to the same data? Is there a notion of identity? Uh, failure detection and all these types of things. And then even the day two operations, automating backups, monitoring these things um, uh, and cluster lifecycle management if I wanna upgrade a database cluster again. So this is all focused at the application level for the end users that really want a, a seamless experience of running uh, a Cassandra database as a database as a service. Um, and then to enable that to happen, of course, under the hood, we're leveraging Many of those features that that you saw in previous slides from Joe and and Gu on those different components of PX Store and backup and migrate and all those things. So all of the underlying functionality that you saw that Portworx supports will actually be available here in sort of a, a an on demand or easier to use nice UX UI UX experience for a user. So so it's more than just pretty window dressing. There's there's a lot more going on. Yeah, to, and and to be frank with you, the the window dressing is the last thing that we've actually added on on here. So we're we're still working through that 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 UI UX experience. Um, but under the hood, it's all API driven. There's pipelines, there's API servers, there's there's multi tenancy and quotas and managing of all of these app, applications that actually get deployed into Kubernetes. And like I said, extending out the the Kubernetes. APIs themselves to enable uh, some of these types of resources. So that thing that I showed you in an example that that Cassandra resource is not a native Kubernetes resource. That's something that we've invented. Uh, likewise, those those DNS endpoints that we create, that's not something that comes with with uh, Kubernetes out of the box. So we enable that and we connect to our own SaaS platform to dynamically create DNS endpoints to enable service discovery for for databases and PDFs. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, you bet.